In this module, we shall learn about the Modigliani's life cycle hypothesis. During the early 1950s, a famous economist, Franco Modigliani, and his student Richard Bramberg worked out a theory of spending based on the idea that people make intelligent choices about how much they want to spend at each age, limited only by the resources available over their lives. By building up new assets and running down old assets, working people can make provision for their retirement and more generally tailor their consumption patterns according to their needs at different ages, which is independent of their incomes at each age. This easy theory leads us to some of the important predictions about the economy as a whole that national savings depends on the rate of growth of national income, not its level and that the level of wealth in the economy bears a simple relation to the length of the retirement span. These predictions, which seemed untestable during 1950s, have received empirical support in later work by Modigliani and other researchers. While the theory of consumption have faced major challenges through the years, most recently from a coalition of psychologists and economists, the life cycle hypothesis remains an essential part of economist thinking. Without it, it would have been very difficult to say about many important issues such as the private and public provision of social security, the role of stock market plays in the economy, how a demographic change changes the pattern of national saving, the role of savings in the economic growth and the determinants of national wealth. Life cycle theory given by Modigliani is an ultimate piece of theory which is supported by many years of empirical work both by supporters and detractors. But it is more than that. It is life cycle theory that helps us think about a host of important policy questions about which we would otherwise have very little to say. One of the most widely debated issues today in both Europe and in the US is how societies should collectively make provision for the increasing number of elderly people. How does government provision interact with the private provision? Is a state pension a substitute for private retirement saving and to what extent? What is the effect of retirement on the economy? Do social security system affect the age at which people retire and with it the amount of wealth in the economy? How does a stock market boom changes the pattern of people's spending and saving. More broadly, anyone who thinks about economic development has to think about the role that savings play in the growth of an economy. Is thrift the wellspring of growth or simply its consequence? What about demography? Will the aging of China bring down its savings rate and brings its growth to a halt? Is that what happened in Japan? Is the wealth of the nation simply a vehicle for retirement provision? Is it really true that they do not play an important role in the national wealth accumulation? After studying this module, you shall be able to know the different concepts consumption functions, learn Modigliani's life cycle hypothesis known as LCH, identify how LCH works, evaluate empirical result of LCH, analyze the shortcomings of LCH. Let us begin by understanding the consumption function. Consumption function plays an important role in the theory of income and employment. There are four basic kinds of macro consumption functions. First, 
Keynes absolute income hypothesis. Second, Dusenberry's relative income hypothesis. Third, Modi Glani's life cycle hypothesis. Fourth, Friedman's permanent income hypothesis. Firstly, we have the Keynes absolute income hypothesis. Here Keynes laid stress on the absolute size of the income as determinant of consumption. According to him, as income increases, consumption also increases, but less than proportionate to rise in income. This can simply be interpreted as marginal propensity to consume being greater than zero, but less than one. Next is Dusenberry's relative income hypothesis. According to Dusenberry's relative income hypothesis, consumption of an individual is not the function of his absolute income, but of his relative position in the distribution in a society, that is, his consumption depends on his income relative to the income of other individuals in the society. For example, suppose the income level of all individuals in the society increase by the same percentage, then his relative income would remain same, though his absolute income has increased. According to him, because relative income has remained same, the individual will spend the same proportion of his income on consumption as he was doing before the absolute increase in his absolute income. Third is Modi Glani's life cycle hypothesis. According to Modi Glani's life cycle hypothesis, individual's consumption is not the function of his current income, but his expected future income throughout his lifetime. Individual wants to maintain steady or slightly increasing consumption pattern throughout their lifetime and for this they base their spending on consumption on future expected income instead of current income. And last, we have Friedman's permanent income hypothesis. According to Friedman's permanent income hypothesis, consumption of an individual depends on his long-term expected income, which is called by Friedman as permanent income, on the basis of which people make their consumption plans, he argued that an individual would prefer a smooth consumption flow per day rather than plenty of consumption today and little consumption tomorrow. Friedman PIH which differs from LCH primarily in that it models rational consumption and saving decisions under the simplifying assumption that life is indefinitely long. Accordingly, the notion of life resources is replaced by that of permanent income, while the discrepancy between current and permanent income is labeled transitory. Further, we shall now discuss life cycle hypothesis. An important post Keynesian theory of consumption has been put forward by Modi Glani and Ando, which is known as life cycle hypothesis theory. According to life cycle theory, the consumption in any period is not a function of current income of that period, but of the whole lifetime expected income. Thus, in life cycle hypothesis, the individual is assumed to plan the pattern of consumption expenditure based in expected income in their entire lifetime. It is further assumed that individual maintains a more or less constant or slightly increasing level of consumption. However, this level of consumption is limited by his expectation of lifetime income. A typical individual in this theory, in his early years of life spends on consumption, either by borrowing from others or spending the assets bequeathed from his or her parents. It is in his main working years of his life 
that he consumed less than the income he earns and therefore makes net positive savings. He invests these savings in assets, that is, accumulating wealth which he consumes in the future years. In his lifetime, after retirement, he again dissaves, that is, consumes more than his income in these later years of his life, but is able to maintain or even slightly increase his consumption in lifetime after retirement. Life cycle hypothesis is depicted in the diagram. It is assumed that a typical individual knows exactly at what age he will die. In the figure, it is taken that the individual would die at the age of 75 years. That is, 75 years is his expected lifetime. It is further assumed that in the life cycle theory, net savings in the entire lifetime is zero. That is, savings done by individuals in his working years of his life is equal to the dissavings made by him in his years of life after retirement and before death. It is also assumed for the sake of simplicity that interest paid on the assets is zero. The curve YY dash shows income pattern of the whole lifetime of the individual, whereas CC dash as the curve of consumption, which is assumed to be slightly increasing as the individual grows old. It is assumed that our individual enters into the labor force at the age of 15 years and grows old. It will be noticed that up to the age of 25 years of his income, though increasing is less than his consumption over his income, he may be borrowing from others. Beyond the age of 25 years, point A on the income and consumption curves and up to the age of 60 years, his income exceeds his consumption, that is, he will be saving during this period of his working life. With these savings, he will build up assets or wealth. He may use these savings or wealth to pay off his debt incurred by him in early stages of his working life. Another important motive of savings is to provide for the consumption after retirement when his income drops below his level of consumption. It will be observed from figure that beyond point B, his current income falls short of his consumption and therefore he once again dissaves. He would be using his accumulated assets from his earlier working years to meet the dissavings after retirement at the age of 65 years. It is important to note that we assume that he does not intend to leave any assets for his children. Under these assumptions, his net savings over his lifetime will be zero. Therefore, his savings during the period when he earns more than his consumption expenditure, that is shaded areas A, H, B, will be equal to the two areas of this savings, C, Y, A plus B, C dash, Y dash. Thus, he dies leaving behind no assets or wealth. He planned his expenditure on consumption over the years in such a way that his net savings at the time of death is zero. However, this assumption can be relaxed of he wishes to leave some assets or wealth for his children. Beyond the age of 25 years, point A on the income and consumption curves and up to the age of 60 years, his income exceeds his consumption, that is, he will be saving during this period of his working life. With these savings, he will build up assets or wealth. He may use these savings or wealth to pay off his debt incurred by him in early stages of his working life. Another important motive of savings is to provide for the consumption after retirement when his income drops below his level of consumption. It will be observed from figure that beyond point B, his current income falls short of his consumption 
and therefore he once again dissaves. He would be using his accumulated assets from his earlier working years to meet the dissavings after retirement at the age of 65 years. It is important to note that we assume that he does not intend to leave any assets for his children. Under these assumptions, his net savings over his lifetime will be zero. Therefore, in figure 1, his savings during the period when he earns more than his consumption expenditure, that is shaded R A H B, will be equal to the two areas of this savings C Y A plus B C dash Y dash. Thus, he dies leaving behind no assets or wealth. He planned his expenditure on consumption over the years in such a way that his net savings at the time of death is zero. However, this assumption can be relaxed of he wishes to leave some assets or wealth for his children. Some important conclusions follow from the life cycle theory of consumption. The fundamental idea of the life cycle hypothesis is that people make their consumption plans for his entire lifetime and further that they make their lifetime consumption plans on the basis of their expectations of lifetime income. Thus, in the life cycle model, consumption is not a mere function of current income but of the expected lifetime income. Besides, in life cycle theory, the wealth presently held by individuals also affects their consumption. The consumption of an individual in a period depends on the factors highlighted by life cycle theory can be expressed in the form of an equation. Let us consider an individual of a given age with an additional life expectancy of t years and intends to retire from working after serving for n years and more. Let us then suppose that in the current period and thereafter in his whole lifespan, the individual will consume a constant proportion, that is 1 by t, of his income in equal installments per year. Thus, ct is equals to 1 by t into ylt plus n minus 1 into y l to the power e plus w t, where c t is the consumption expenditure in the current period t, y l t is the income earned from doing some labor in the current period, n minus 1 is the remaining future years of doing some labor work, y l to the power e is the average annual income expected to be earned over n minus 1 years for which individual plans to do some work. WT is presently held wealth or assets. It can be observed from the above equation that life cycle hypothesis suggests that consumption in any period does not depend only on current income but also on his presently owned wealth or assets which are built up during prime working of one's life when income exceeds savings. To estimate the behavior of consumer on the basis of life cycle hypothesis, one is required to make some assumption how people their expectation regarding labor income over their lifetime. In the study of consumption function for United States, Ando and Modigliani made the assumption that the expected future labor income is simply a multiple of current labor income. Thus, according to this assumption, y l to the power e is equals to beta into y l t, where beta is the multiple of current labor income. This assumption implies that people revise their expected labor of future by certain multiple of change in current labor income. With this assumption, aggregate consumption function for the community can be expressed as under C1 is equals to B1 plus B2 into beta bracket close into YLT plus B3 into WT. 
This function has been estimated taking the time series data for USA and following estimates have been obtained. CT is equals to 0.72 YLT plus 0.06 W. According to these estimates, if current labor income increases by rupees 100 along with assumed effect on expected future income, consumption will increase by rupees 72 per period. Besides the increase in wealth by rupees 100 will raise the consumption expenditure by rupees 6. It therefore follows that according to life cycle hypothesis, the relationship between income and consumption is non-proportional. Increase in labor income by rupees 100 crore leads to increase in consumption by rupees 72. Further, the intercept term of the consumption function. The consumption based on the life cycle hypothesis is illustrated in figure where along X axis we measure the disposable income and along Y axis the consumption expenditure. The short run consumption function is shown by the curve which has slope of 0.6 which is the marginal propensity to consume out of labor income in the short run. This short run consumption function is linear and has an intercept term indicating that average propensity to consume declines as labor income increases and MPC is less than APC. The intercept of the short run consumption function measures the effect of wealth on consumption. Since wealth increases over a period of time due to savings in the prime working years, the short run consumption function will be shifted upward that is, the intercept of the short run consumption function will be increasing as wealth grows in the long run. Over time, the shift in the short run consumption function may trace a series of points on a long run consumption function passing through the origin. Moving to the implications of the model. This basic model led to a number of implications which were at that time quite novel and surprising almost counterintuitive. They included the following. First, the saving rate in a country is completely independent of the country's per capita income. Second, the national saving rate is not simply the result of differential thrift of its citizens in the sense that different national saving rates are consistent with an identical individual life cycle behavior. Third, in countries having identical individual behavior, the aggregate saving rate will be higher. The higher is the long run growth rate of the economy. It will be zero for zero growth. Fourth, the wealth income ratio is a decreasing function of the growth rate, thus being largest at zero growth. Fifth, a country can easily accumulate a substantial stock of wealth relative to income even if no wealth is passed on by bequest. Sixth, the main parameter that controls the wealth income ratio and the saving rate for given growth is the prevailing length of retirement. Further, now we have the major areas of applications with a brief statement of the life cycle hypothesis implications. First, short run stabilization policy. First, the monetary mechanism. The fact that wealth enters importantly in the short run consumption function means that monetary policy can affect aggregate demand not only through the traditional channel of investment but also through the market value of assets and consumption. Transitory income taxes. Attempts at restraining or stimulating demand through transitory income taxes or rebates can be expected to have small effects on consumption and to lower saving because consumption depends on life resources which are little affected by a transitory tax change. Secondly, we have long run propositions. First, consumption taxes. A progressive tax on consumption 
is more equitable than one on current income because it more nearly taxes permanent income quite apart from its incentive effects on saving second short and long run effects of deficit financing expenditures financed by deficit tends to be paid by future generations those financed by taxes are paid by the generation living today the conclusion is based on the proposition that private saving being controlled by life cycle considerations should be independent of the government budget stands and therefore private wealth should be independent of the national debt next we have the shortcoming of the life cycle hypothesis gardner atley has criticized the assumption of life cycle hypothesis that in making consumption plans households have a definite and conscious vision according to him the vision on the part of the households sounds unrealistic also according to him it is highly inappropriate to have complete knowledge of family's future size including life expectancy of each member entire lifetime profile of income of each member etc life cycle hypothesis fails to recognize the importance of liquidity constraints in determining the response of consumption to income according to critics even if a household has a concrete vision of future income the opportunities to borrow from capital market for quite a long period on the basis of expected future income is very little further we have the life cycle theory as it appears today for a theory that is so central to economic analysis and that has been worked on by so many people the life cycle hypothesis has aged well and although the ways in which the theory is used have changed the hypothesis continues to provide the framework in which economists think about intertemporal issues at both the individual and economy wide levels the life cycle hypothesis affects the understanding of the working of the economy and of the effectiveness of fiscal and monetary policies like life cycle hypothesis provides a direct linkage between the monetary policy interest rate and consumption because a change in the interest rate affects the market value of assets and therefore consumption in case of a fiscal policy life cycle hypothesis suggests that expenditures financed by deficit tends to be paid by future generations those financed by taxes are paid by current generations national debt is hence a burden as it reduces the stock of private capital which in turn reduces the flow of output if capital is productive to summarize we have learned how modigliani explained the pattern of consumption in an economy consumption pattern is important to understand how much from income can household abstain which is for savings to arise savings play a very important function in an economy life cycle hypothesis explains how consumption pattern are based in lifetime expected income and not just on the current income the individuals wish to have steady consumption throughout their lifetime they are rational and can understand lifetime is divided into three phases the very young is when they borrow and consume and thus dis save in their prime working age they abstain from consumption and save and create wealth for themselves which they use for consumption after retirement and to pay off the debt taken during the initial years for finite household they streamline their consumption according to future expected income and this is the essence of the life cycle hypothesis model